Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to meet you here today on this sunny and warm day at Riga Business School. My name is Elza Priede and I am RBS Community Manager. And I have graduated from the MBA program myself. I am especially glad to be here today because RBS Professional MBA program has changed my life personally and professionally. So I truly wish you to take the leap of faith and start the change in your, life, in your lives as well. The agenda for today is as follows. At 6 p.m. we will have a short intro lecture from one of our faculty members, Greg Mathers, on, drive, on the topic driving transformation. Then at 6 p.m., MBA programs director, Aldis Greitans, will introduce you to the content of the program, the mission, and the details of the program. And then after 15 minutes, we will invite our alumni and students for a short discussion. So that will be a great opportunity for you to ask your questions to people who have gone through the program very recently. Without further ado, I am introducing to you Greg Mathers, one of the most inspiring and experienced RBS faculty members. He teaches organizational behavior, change management, business communication skills, and leadership here at RBS. All the hottest management topics currently. A dear audience, I want to let you know that you will be added as panel speakers for Greg's part so you could interact with him. And if you have any questions, please write them in the chat box. We will do our best to answer them within the time limits. Greg, the Zoom is yours. Good. Thanks, Elva. So welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for joining me. And, and it's an honor to get to present to you and talk to you today. So as Elza said, I'm going to talk something about transformation. Um, I've got a presentation, but also as we go through this, I'd, I'd like to interact with you and, and ask questions and, and have you just speak up and answer as you feel you should, All right? So I will share my screen and get this started. Now, as I go through this, some of this information comes from a man named Lars Sudman in, in uh, Belgium, and it also comes from Dr. Itzak Adizas in, uh, in the United States. And, and, you know, these are some of the things when you come to RBS that you will study in, and some of the people that you could study from. And so what this is about is driving transformation by thinking inside the box. Okay? And, and today, transformation is, is a big topic. And it's become almost something of a fad. And, you know, everybody is transforming their organizations so that we can be more innovative, so that we can capture markets, so that we can beat the competition and, um, you know, disrupt our different markets and competitors and things like that. And, and that's what transformation is about. And maybe some of you in your companies are going through an organizational transformation. Um, and, and, you know, if you think about a transformation, what really is it? And if you want to start it, how do you get it started? And one way to start it is simply to put on the wall a nice picture of a caterpillar. And that caterpillar is going to go through a metamorphosis and come out a butterfly. And then along with that picture, you can just put on there some text that said, if nothing ever transforms, there would be no butterflies. And, and so that could get us started, people thinking in the right direction. And then of course, with that, because we want more innovation, we want openness and things like that, you gotta have some bean bags. So you can throw bean bags on the floor so people are comfortable and, and you can see there's not really any hierarchy there. And there's even a tent where you can go take a nap if you feel like it. And, and so, you know, you're, they're sharing with your colleagues in an open environment and so on. And, and as you're collecting ideas, of course, you have to have the post-it notes so that we can make sure that we've got everything captured and we can move those around and, and group ideas and accumulate things. And, and of course, as we're doing that, um, we're, we're generating new things and new ideas. We're creating a new climate. And then along with that, we have to have outside of meetings, we have to have the ability to communicate. And one way to always do that was around the water cooler, 
right? So you have a water cooler in place, people congregate there, they raise ideas and talk about issues while they're outside of their office, um, and it promotes the free flowing of ideas. But today that's not quite good enough, so we also have to have a foosball table. Right? And we gather around the foosball table, let off some energy, build some relationships, and we're transforming the organization so that we have a fun place to work. And we can create new ideas, new ways of working. And that's all it takes, right? Well, maybe not. Right? Because some things get in the way of this transformation. There's things going on inside the organization like people don't really trust each other. And they're thinking, you know, what is in it for me? I need the next promotion. He's trying to get the promotion. Why should I share information with him? Why should I help him? He never helps me. I, this is going on in organization. The other thing that gets in the way is transformation fatigue. Management has tried so many things in the past and this is just the next thing on the list. And they get tired, they get frustrated, they lose trust in their top management. And so the next thing that comes along, they don't buy into it. And what do they do? They end up resisting, build up resistance to change. And so the only way to get people to change is just to drag them along. Right? And, and these things get in the way of a transformation. And so what I want to say is that we all know where transformation starts. Right? It's got to start at the top of the organization. You got to have top management and especially the CEO buy into it. If the CEO is not pushing it, it's not going to go anywhere. So transformation starts with leaders. And it often starts with them sitting around a table, discussing strategy, discussing markets, discussing new products. You know, how are we going to capture these markets? How are we going to beat the competition? And eventually somebody thinks about this transformation going on and that what we really need to do is let's think outside the box. Now this box has a lot of attention. People don't like being in this box. They think everything that's gonna help our organization is actually outside the box. And that if we can only get outside of that box, we're gonna be more successful make more money, satisfy more clients, and get more profits. But what I want to talk about today is how does transformation actually start? And leaders, good leaders, transformation starts with leaders who think inside the box. Okay. Now, now, what does this mean? And, and how, how does this work? Okay. I know you're thinking that this goes against everything that you've been reading and studying, and how can somebody from an MBA program say that we need to think inside the box? Well, there's some evidence for this. If we look at these two, this graph here, we've got on one axis, we've got confusion, and on the other information. And we know that if there's not enough information, people are confused. We also know that if there's too much information, people are confused. And so really the way to limit the confusion is to limit the amount of information. There's a sweet spot in there where just the right amount of information lets people know what's going on, but doesn't give them so much that they're confused. And that's what we have to find is where is that sweet spot? And what this really says is that less is more. And so to get there, what I wanna look at is what is inside that box. And there's a number of different boxes that, that are there, but we're gonna look at one specific today. Okay? And this is the role box. What do I mean the, by the role box? And what I mean by what this actually talks about is what roles do well-managed organizations fulfill inside this box? What do they actually do that they're well-managed? 
the first thing that organizations do is they are effective. Right? What does it mean to be effective? Anybody want to speak up and give it a try? What does it mean to be effective? All of you every day are working in organizations. Part of what you need to do is to be effective. What does that mean? To be effective is to accomplish the results. To accomplish your goals. Was that all this? No, that was somebody else. Who was that? Who spoke up? It was me. <laughs> okay. So it means to accomplish your goals. If this phone is effective, what does it do? I can make phone calls with it, right? It does what it was designed to do. It was designed with a certain purpose. And so being effective really means that I, you fulfill your purpose. Okay? Now, what's the purpose of an organization? Anybody speak up? You can volunteer. I'm going to start calling on people. How about Albert? Start with A. Uh, hello. Hi, Albert. I think that the purpose of organization is uh, fulfill uh, goals. Uh -huh. It means uh, budget. It means some uh, social activities, uh, environment for workers. No. Something like that. Okay, good, good. Who else wants to give it a try? Purpose of an organization. Linda. I think the purpose is to create value for its customers. Create value, all right. Good, anybody else? A lot of times what the answer I get is, our purpose is to make money, to get profit. Or our purpose is to grow. Right? And I'm here to say that, you know, that's not your purpose. And what, uh, what we were just told is actually the purpose of a company. Linda said it. A purpose of, the purpose of every organization, whether it's for-profit, not-for-profit, government organization, is to provide for client needs. You have to provide something that clients need. Otherwise, you're not gonna have clients for long unless you're a monopoly. Well, even monopolies provide things clients need, right? Lot Venergo, well, when they were a monopoly, they still provided energy. And people, they don't have any choice who they buy from, but they still need what they're selling. Otherwise, people wouldn't buy it. So this is, the purpose of every organization is really to, to provide for client needs. Now, is that enough to be successful? A well-managed organization. How about Paula? What do you think? Are you there, Paula? I'm here, but I don't know what to say. <laughs> Yes or no? Is, is it enough to be a well-managed organization? Just to be effective, providing for client needs? Well, you always have to be aware of everything to be successful. Uh-huh. Okay. Anybody else? What else uh, do you... Yes, um, go ahead. From your uh, last uh, discussions, they should be effective, efficient, and work in long term and short term. Okay. <laughs> All right. So they need to be efficient, right? They're efficient, which means what? That they can improve their speed, they can improve their quality. Those are things clients want. And they can keep their costs under control. Because it's really easy to improve speed and improve quality by spending more and spending more. Right? But then you don't have any margin left. So, and this is what actually will give an organization its profit. So profit isn't the purpose, it's the ability to fulfill that purpose efficiently. All right. So 
Alberts. <laughs> and probably profit shows how efficient is your organization as well. Uh huh. All right. So well managed organizations provide for client needs and they administer certain processes, systems, they get organized and things like that. So they have these two roles a P role and an A role. And by doing this, they can make a profit. Now this P role and A role though, only work in the short term. Why? Why only the short term? Because there is some kind of a limit for getting profit and being effective. Uh-huh, okay. What else happens if I if I make this phone and and people really like it, it fulfills needs and I can get it to them at a good price. So I make a profit for how long can I keep selling the same phone? Maybe after some time, the needs of clients is changing. Right. And, because uh, of change. Needs client needs change because of what competition is doing, because of technology, because of changes in, in uh, the environment, because of changes in politics and laws. Right? What we can offer customers is constantly changing. And so what we sell today we, is not gonna be so relevant in the future. And so we need to constantly uh, reinvent what we're doing. So it's change that is driving this. So for effectiveness, we, we still need to be effective and efficient, but to be effective in the long term, we need another role, which is an entrepreneurial role. And by having that entrepreneurial role means we innovate and we change. We change the way we're working. We change the products we're offering. Uh, we change how we offer them. Um, and so that we can continue to provide for changing client needs. Right. Now, if you think about yourself, you already know that you do this. When you go to work, you're there to provide for somebody's needs. Your client may be your boss. Or if you work in, in production, your client may be in sales or logistics, or it can change every day. And you have to, to provide for their needs. You have to get works done. If you're not fulfilling some need in the organization, then there's no reason for you to be there. And the other part of that is you have to do it according to deadlines. You have to do it within certain cost structures, right? And that's the efficiency part. And so you as an individual fulfill these roles also. And then you should constantly be improving how you work. Because you know, if you don't change how you're working over two or three years, if you don't educate yourself, your, your skills are gonna become obsolete. So you have to constantly develop your skills. And that's the E role and organizations have to do the same thing. Right? And this allows them to provide for changing client needs. Now, where does efficiency in the long-term come from? Who wants to try? So the, the, the E role is about change. What happens when you try to introduce change in an organization? You've all gone through this, what happens? As you mentioned earlier, there is a lot of stages in the end you have to pull someone <laughs> by leg. <laughs> okay, that could be it, right? Some people you have to pull along. Some people like the change. Some people want to change a different way or some people don't want to change at all, right? And so what's happening is they're now pulling the organization in different directions. And that's really inefficient, right? Efficiency in the long term is how do we integrate people so that people change together rather than resisting change or, or trying to change in different directions? 
How do we integrate them around change? And then we can change very quickly, right? People come together, they discuss it, they agree on it, and then they just change. But what often happens in organizations is a change get in, gets introduced, people don't understand why the change, the change isn't good for their department, it's good for somebody else, and they're pulling in different directions, and, and the change goes nowhere, right? Or it moves very slowly, and it's very difficult to do. And so these are four roles, and these four roles actually exist inside the box. Right? This is not out of the box thinking. This is the four roles that, if, if that box represents your organization, the, the, that's what thinking inside the box means, is focusing on these four roles. Now, why is this important for a transformation? Anybody want to try? Why focus on this if we're talking about transformation? Here it is, the next slide. The four roles are not compatible. They drive conflict, all right? Now, what does that mean? First of all, you have short-term roles versus long-term roles, right? And you know in yourself, when you have short-term priorities and you have long-term priorities, what happens? <laughs> you focus on the short-term and the long-term gets done some other time organizations can't afford to do that. They have to have all four roles going at the same time. They have to have, be fulfilling their short-term priorities and their long-term priorities today. Um, and then effectiveness versus efficiency. To be more effective means what? It means to satisfy client needs. And, and uh, let me give it to you this way. If everybody here, if I invited you for a, a dinner and I said, okay, to be most effective, I'm gonna cook everybody's favorite meal. How efficient would I be doing that? To cook, I don't know, however many people there are here, to cook that many different meals, to go out and shop for that many different meals. My, I would have no efficiency. Efficient would be that I order one type of pizza and you eat it whether you like it or not. And, but maybe you don't like it, but that's more efficient. Okay. So effectiveness is about satisfying the needs of the market. Efficiency is about satisfying the needs of the company. And, and those that can be incompatible. And all four roles are incompatible because the P role that pro providing for client needs is about what we're going to do. The A role is about how are we going to do it? And those two can be in conflict. And we'll look at an example in a minute. Okay. Um, the E role and the I role. The E role is about constant change. The I role is about, and, and how do we do things differently all the time? That, that's the E role. And the I role is more about just how do we get people to work together? And so the E role is pulling people apart because people wanna change differently. And the I role is trying to get them back together and they're not really compatible. And so some examples, okay? So the first one here I've got, if you think about a company that uh, does prefabricated houses, now the sales department in this company, what is their interest? Anybody who's in sales? What's the interest of sales? What's their role? Let me ask it that way. How about Giannis? What's the role of sales? If you think about the four roles. Well, I'm personally not in sales, but I think that sales is uh, just to get more sales and get the job for production. Okay, and they, but they do that. Their, their role, though, is to provide um, client needs. Uh, go ahead, Diana. Yeah, 
I, I also wanted to tell that uh, for sales, the most important to understand clients' needs. And uh -huh. from that, uh, you can understand what uh, you can sell to someone. Right. First of all, uh, their needs. First of all, what they want, uh, what they need. And then uh, you come around with your proportion. Uh -huh. I suggest What's that uh, in the roles of pi, it would be a role P. The P role. Producer, okay. yes. Right? The P role, right? That's their primary role. They still have to do the other three. They have to file sales reports, which is A. They have to be creative in how they approach customers, and that, that's E. And then they have to work together as a team. That's I. But primary, their, primary, their, their first role is P role. And providing for client needs. Now, what's the role of production? What's their interest? What's production measured on? Efficiency, how much is possible okay. to produce with the minimum resource. Right, so efficiency. They're measured on that. A lot of times they're rewarded on it. Now, so sales, you know, they, they want to take care of their clients. We're selling prefabricated houses. Clients want different houses. Not every client wants the same house that's in on the website. Some will want bathroom in a different place. Some will want more windows. Some will want uh, another bedroom. And then what happens when sales goes to production and says, we need to change the house? Right? That's conflict because it undermines the role of production. And you always hear production complaining, oh, sales changes orders too often. Or sales is complaining, oh, production is inflexible. They, they won't give us what clients want. And, and that, but really they're just fulfilling their roles. Okay? And so that's how these roles can be in, in uh, conflict. Here's another one in a bank the corporate loan department, right? Corporate loan department, they're trying to sell loans to companies, but before they can give a company a loan, what do they have to do? Who works, anybody work in a bank? They have to go before the credit committee, right? And the credit committee has to approve or, or deny the loan. Right? So again, there's conflict and the corporate loan officer is trying to sell the loans. The, 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 court, the credit committee is evaluating the risk to the company. So they're protecting the company. While the, the, the salesperson, the loan officer is trying to take care of clients. And again, that can create a lot of conflict between should we service these or, or, or not service these? Okay, so those are a couple of conf uh, P and A conflicts, but all four of these roles are in conflict. Right? Sales is constantly trying to sell products. They finally teach the customer how to buy a product. And then here comes new product development who changes the product or marketing wants to change the pricing, right? Because marketing is a lot of the E role. And they're trying to change things. They're try, they're, at, they're, they evaluate the market and want to change things. New product development wants to introduce change. And so these four roles are, are really incompatible and they drive a lot of conflict. Okay. So why does transformation start inside the box? If you think about an individual person, right? where does an individual transformation start? It starts inside the person. It starts with them learning to manage their fears, learning to manage their self doubts, learning to manage their internal conflict. Right? And that's part of the maturing of a person that they become a mature person so that they can handle bigger and bigger problems. They can handle everything that life throws at them, is the way we say it. 
And when a person has done that, we say about that person, well, that person has it all together. When a person is, hasn't done that, we might say that person's falling apart. And it's the same in an organization. That we have to work with inside the organization. We have to get these roles and the people that represent these different roles to be able to work together, to solve problems together so that they can actually transform the company. Because what happens a lot of times is you have a company where people inside the company, you know, the relationships aren't real strong. The, uh, they, they don't collaborate across functions. You, you're working in functional silos. You have sales working on sales, production working on production, marketing is on marketing, and, and they don't really talk to each other much. They're just doing their jobs. And each department's idea is that our job is the one that's most important. And the only time they do communicate is when there's problems. And then it's, you know, who are they gonna find to blame? Who are they gonna go yell at? Because I didn't get this on time or that didn't happen or, or this was done wrong. And then when we have that kind of culture and top management says, oh, and, and, and it's impacting our results. Right? We see maybe market share goes down, or we see that, that, um, that we're losing sales, our customer complaints go up, or that employee turnover rises. And so then what does top management say? Oh, we need a new strategy. So they sit around, they develop a strategy. You know, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna do that. And then they've got this box that's full of all of this conflict and this garbage and stuff that doesn't work. And now they throw into the box on top of it, a new strategy. How is that supposed to work? It doesn't work. And that's why we see strategic initiatives fail so often is because they start by looking at the outside and trying to adjust and do something to, to take advantage of what they see outside when their inside has not been taken care of, when their inside doesn't really operate effectively and efficiently. When there's conflicts between these different roles, you know, if you think about it, if you think about three to five problems that your company faces, that you have control over, controllable problems. A controllable problem is uh, our, what kind of marketing we put out there, what kind of sales process we use, what kind of structure we put in place. And uncontrollable problems are like what our suppliers are doing. We can influence that, but we can't control it. What is happening with uh, gas prices or interest rates? Right? Those aren't really problems. Those are situations that we have to, to deal with, that we have to exist within, we have to work within. The problems are things going on inside our company that we have control over. And if you think about three to five of them, how many of them did you have a year ago? And what I've experienced is that most companies will say all of them. And if you think about two years ago, most of them. And three years ago, a lot of them. And so what are the chances if you've had these problems for one or two or three years, that if you don't change how you're working internally, you're gonna still have these problems a year from now. And the thing is, is that you're gonna have them, all of those and more. And really, the problem is, is not those three to five things you thought about. The problem is that you can't solve those problems. And the reason why is that we haven't figured out how to get these PAEI roles working together, how to deal with the conflicts of interest that are represented by these four roles, 
and, and, and how to use the structure and how to use process and, and how to use different tools to make all of this inside the box work. And then when you've got what's inside the box working, now we can look at how do we transform? How do we take advantage of what we see in the market? And then we can easily change because we, we, we work together. We trust each other. We respect each other. And so when we see an opportunity, we go talk to each other. We talk through the conflicts that uh, exist. You know, why is this not going to be good for me? Why is it going to be good for you? How do we compromise? And in that short term, in, in those times when we're coming together to solve problems, it's always compromise. Right? If, if uh, the prefabricated company, prefabricated housing company, if the sales department wants to change the production, wants to customize a house, and the production department says no, somebody has to compromise. There's no win-win situation in the short term. It's either we have, sales has to say sorry to the customer or production has to compromise on their efficiency. And eventually, in the longer term, maybe we can figure out what to do about it if we can work together and talk to each other and, and learn from each other and not just fight with each other. <laughs> then we can have a culture where we can actually change and adapt. So that's what I wanted to give to you today. If, if anybody has any questions or comments, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but really, that's why I say when you're talking about transformation, it's not think outside the box until you fixed what's inside the box. Right? So a different way of thinking about it, but one that I hope you can find useful. Thank you, Greg. Uh -huh. It was great as always. <laughs> Thank you for inspiring us. So maybe if the audience doesn't have any questions at the moment, I will ask my questions. Okay. Go we ahead. haven't talked much about RBS programs yet, but the information will follow. Uh, and you've had a lot of experience teaching at RBS. And maybe some of the audience members are still thinking if executive MBA program or professional MBA program is the right for them. Maybe you could outline the difference between those two programs in your opinion. Uh -huh. Okay. So, you know, of course, there's a difference in the, who, who is the audience for each one, who's the potential client. So, so executive, you need, you need to have more experience at the executive level, right? To really qualify for that program. But, but at, and then the, beyond that, the differences are that with the professional MBA, you know, you're gonna go through a more traditional study program in which you're taking one or two classes a week um, after work in the evenings, for three hours each evening. Um, and you'll do that for a period of two and a half years. <laughs> um, and then and you'll write a thesis and, and you'll be done. So it's, it's a pretty traditional approach. It works for a lot of people. Um, and and it's, it's a really good program and, and uh, I enjoy teaching in it. You know, the qual it's amazing over the last few years, the quality of students coming in has really gone up. And maybe that's just because I'm getting old, but I don't know. Like, like I'm, I'm afraid to do presentations anymore. I, I'm supposed to be teaching presentations and the students' presentations are better than mine. But uh, anyway, <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so that's the professional MBA. And then the executive MBA and, and the other thing about professional is, you know, you, you go class by class and you always have different groups of people in, in each class. So you register for, you choose which classes to take 
in which order. I mean, there's some you have to take in certain orders, but you know, pretty much you get to, you get more free choice of the courses that you're going to take and in what order, right? which is nice. Um, and then you'll have different students and some of the same students in the different courses. The executive MBA, you go through in a cohort. So you go through with a group of 10 or 15 or however many students that are in that, that cohort. It always starts in, in January, whereas professional MBA starts in September. Um, and then you don't have any choice about the courses you take. There's a prescribed uh, series of courses. You start with organizational behavior and then you take you, you know, different courses um, as they come up. So there's a regular calendar for which you have to take those courses. Uh, the study pattern is different in that you will study once a month, one weekend a month, I guess Thursday through Saturday. Um, and that's January through May or April. And then, and then again, September through December. So you, you show up, you know, four days out of the month. Um, and each class in both programs, each, each class is three hours long. Um, and then the executive MBA, though, you will be together with this same group. Um, they build strong relationships over that period of time. They have study trips when they can, when they can go on trips. Um, and and we, which is nice. So I, I believe there's two study trips in the EMBA program, one in Europe and then one somewhere else, sometimes North America, sometimes Asia. I don't know if they've ever been to South America. They South have. Africa. South Africa, I know, but South America, I, I don't know about, probably not yet. Um, so, so that's really the difference, right? Um, and, and both have pros and cons. So it's, you know, whatever works best for you. Mm -hmm. Did that answer the question? Well enough? Yes, thank you so much. Now that I think about it, actually, both professional MBAs and executive MBAs, for the most part, meet you in the OB course at first, right? Yeah. When they start the studies. Uh, the first course is typically OB. Yes. Okay. For executive so, MBA, it always is. For professionals, sometimes it's the second course. Yeah. It just depends That's on what students choose. Yeah. So do you have just one last thing before we let you go? What is... What do you wish for the potential students and for the audience today? Um, you know, uh, the, the thing is that that's impressive already is that you're here and you're thinking about this education because this is something that you can always put off, right? <laughs> you can always do it next year or next year or next year. Um, and so that, that you show up and they're actually ready to take this step is really important. Um, and it, it says already a lot about your character and that you know, you're ambitious and that, uh, that you want to develop yourself and develop your career. Um, and that, that you realize the importance that continuous development and improvement plays in that process. And so I, I, what I would wish is that you, know, that, that you really you know, this is a, a big decision um, and that you look at what's available and you choose the program that's right for you. Right. Sorry, and, I have questions. Can I? Sure. Uh, uh, for Greg, uh, which of program, uh, professional uh, or executive more makes transformation, not just uh, gathering of knowledge? So, so you mean transformation of the person? Yes, yes. Of the yes. individual. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, I, you know, it, it could be that the executive MBA is more focused on that because they have a leadership development practicum, which I didn't mention. And that runs over the, the entire uh, program. So you start it when you first start, you start pro in the leadership program. And then you take courses in that. There's four sections. You know, there, there's the individual development section, there's team section, there's organizational development section, and then there's the social responsibility section of that. 
So in terms of personal development, uh, you know, I mean, both are focused on personal development for sure, but the leadership, the, the EMBA has that leadership development practicum. Um, at the same time, there is a leadership course also in the professional MBA program, right? But, but it's, it's not focused so much on that personal development route that maybe the EMBA has. Did I get that right, Aldous? Almost. Thank you for your answer. <laughs> okay. And, and all this is that, did I get? Yeah, that's me actually. Yeah, you're right. Well, actually, I should say that uh, uh, both programs are transformational, but in a uh, professional MBA case, it, it more transforms you uh, from, uh, uh, let's say, a specialist or, or, or the person who is in a managerial role to the person who uh, knows everything or almost everything what, what a ma good manager should know. And I, I can speak from my personal experience because I graduated from Riga Business School in 96. Well, and it, that was transformational for me because when, when, I, when I started studying here in Riga Business School, I was in a position of a, a marketing manager, marketing director of a bank. And I, I got into a position, previous position was a programmer working with, with credit cards. Uh, that was uh, quite some turn in my, in my career. And, and, and can you imagine I was uh, like running that position and, and I'm thinking what the hell is going on? And, 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 and most of the things I should do, I don't understand. And uh, I've got in Riga Business School and, and it was, was sort of eye opening actually. And one of my openings was uh, just as Greg you like introduced just minutes ago to the complex world of management. And that was a personal feeling of, uh, well, the more I understand, the less I understand. Uh, but I certainly got capabilities to do more, let's say, uh, conscious things in, in, in my job. Well, talking about uh, executive MBA, uh, well, um, this, is, this is more for persons uh, uh, whose next step probably is to work on their personality, to, to develop their careers, to, to make them better managers. Um, this is my simple answer. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank uh, you so much. Oh, uh, sorry? It's useful also for middle manager if you have a dream to get higher. Absolutely, absolutely. I will talk about this in a minute. <laughs> Thank you all for your question. And I can jump in a little bit on top of this uh, is in professional MBA program, you will be able to choose elective courses, but the leadership professional develop leadership uh, development practicum for executive MBAs is a core part of it. So both of the programs have it if you choose it for professionals and it's built in the executive program. Thank you so much, Greg. Sure, that was fun. So thank yeah. you for having me. Thank you, thank you for your time.